so it just rifles through people's lives and, and it takes on this kind of like comedic almost tone. Sorry, this guy's got a very long lens. You got what you need? Got what I need. Can I look at my nose and see there? Anyway, 
Is he incredible in this movie? <laughs> Did you actually think you're nominated for a Golden Globe Award this summer? <laughs> oh, my Amazing. Amazing. Uh, he's suddenly into this format, people. I've been talking to them for two hours. Yeah. They're fans, you can tell. This movie's really, really, you can tell right now, too. We just opened a week ago. It's doing great, right? So far, so good. Yeah, the reviews have been very good. And I mean, pretty much every time an audience sees it, we get a lot of great feedback. It seems like you guys must have liked it. You stuck around, right? Woo! <laughs> I'm really excited to get to see the movie with Star in it right afterwards, too. It's yes. exciting. Laurel and Hardy, were you always a fan? Were you always a fan? Being a human I wish I was. A human being, because I let out with this question. All right, all right. All right. The next question. Were you always a fan of Steve Coogan? <laughs> <laughs> no, I didn't know Steve very well, actually. I, I knew his work. I knew him as Alan Partridge. You know, Steve is very famous in England. I don't know how many of you are aware of his work here, but yeah, there you go. Good. Well, I won't tell him. I'll say no one talks to you. I'm sorry. <laughs> we do that a lot. We tease each other a lot. No, I knew his work with Alan Partridge and the trip movies, but we've only met socially a couple times before we were thrown together to make this. And Steve is from the same area where Stan Laurel is from. Um, and he also grew up doing comedy, and uh, so when, so even though it was very intimidating to be thrown together like that, and mean, and have to, I mean, we had the luxury of actually having the Laurel and Hardy as an inspiration and, and something we could base our stuff on. When the Laurel and Hardy were thrown together, they were just plucked out of obscurity by Hal Roach and said, "Oh yeah, if that one was skinny, well, that'd be funny." But about as much forethought as that. And they were thrown together. Come on back, boys, because Hal Roach had just lost Harold Lloyd, his big star at the time. And so he was looking for his next big act, and he got it on the first try. Um, but the point I'm making is that Steve and I, even though we didn't know each other, we found a lot of comfort in the actual story of Stan Laurel and Oliver Hardy, the fact that they, too, didn't know each other. They were thrown together for the purposes of a movie and were told, come up with an act, boys, start rehearsing, come, you know, come up with some gags. And so we went through what they went through, in a way. Uh, we had, like I said, the luxury of using them as our inspiration, but all of that rehearsal, all of the double door routine and, the, and the, all the different lotsy that we do, like at the hotel clerk or um, all the routines, we had to re rehearse them for hours and hours and hours and hours, many, many weeks even before the rehearsal for this movie started. I was coming in on the weekends um, when I was working on another film and rehearsing that dance with Steve because we wanted to, as close as we could, really, I mean, we, we took a lot of creative license in the movie in terms of their stage show because there's no film of it. We had to almost kind of imagine what they were doing, the scripts and stuff you can get. But for that scene, for the Way Out West dance, we wanted to take almost a forensic approach to it. We wanted to reproduce it as closely as we could. Um, and that includes the mistakes. When you watch the dance, one of the most beautiful things about that dance is it's, it's a joke. The whole thing itself is a joke. You're just listening to music and then <laughs> change it up a little bit. And then it builds from there. It's literally, it's like one of their, you know, like in their movies, they were, they had a, a lot of these, I don't know how many people were our fans of them already or know them. So you know that in their comedy, they often ramp up from some tiny little thing into some catastrophe. You know, the movie Helpmates, one of my favorite shorts. Oliver asks Stan to come and help him clean up his house after a party. And by the end of the film, Oliver's house is burned to the ground. <laughs> so that dance, in a way, is like a perfect microcosm of the perfect Laurel and Hardy gag because it starts out literally something a child could do, tap their foot to the beat of a song. And then it builds and builds and builds and it turns into this ballet and they're doing island flings and you know, all these... Um, so we wanted to get that right, and we tried to, we tried to exactly replicate what we could about that dance, including like the kind of shambling quality and the mistakes that they make. 
Because when you watch the dance, when you really watch it over and over like you did, you notice that, oh, Oliver missed that step, and now he's catching up. Or you see these little hiccups, you know? Wow. Yeah. Do you think they even knew they made mistakes? Or you could watch it so Yeah, I mean, it's, it, that's part of the charm of their work, is it just seems kind of loose and, and it speaks to their real their professionalism as performers. Like, even when something went wrong, they got back into it and found their way back into it. But um, it, was interesting. it was an interesting thing, not only having to learn the dance, but then learn the mistakes and learn the strange little idiosyncrasies or the, the timings of, of this and, and that. But the whole thing was really, um, it was like a summoning a spirit of somebody, you know? And every day when I would sit in that makeup chair, it would take about three hours in the morning to put it on and about an hour at the end of the day to take it off. And every morning I would sit there for three hours Sitting there, staring in the mirror, watching myself turn into Oliver Hardy, that really did look a lot like him by the time they were done. Does that help you? Oh, yeah, that's the first gateway. That's the first thing that allowed, that makes you think like, okay, well, at least I look like him. Now i got to find out what was inside this guy. Why was he the way he was? Um, but anyway, everyone I was almost like praying to the guy every day. <laughs> or, or summoning him, or thinking, you know, think. I thought so much about him every day because I had all those hours just sitting there while meditating about it and almost like asking for his help. And, you know, I would sit there with an the iPad up and watch their films over and over. And um, it was an interesting thing. This, I've never done that before with any role. I've played real people before, but they, they don't have 100 films that you can watch. Um, that's, that's the, the pressure, pressure of doing something like this, this where they, they can easily refer to it in every story about it. They'll see the real footage and be judging you guys. And I, think I, also, also, I hope tonight when you go home that you'll go on to YouTube because every single thing that Laura and Hardy ever did is available for free right now. And I, I hope that we show you some of the humanity of who they were as people. But who they were as performers, you can only see from watching their films. And I hope tonight when you go home, if you want some suggestions, there's one that's 20 minutes long called Hellbates that I just mentioned. There's a famous one that was shot, a lot of them were shot in Silver Lake. There's one called The Music Box where they're trying to move a piano, which we kind of, we put like an echo of it in the movie when we dropped that trunk down the stairs. But. More than an echo, I love that scene, actually, where you did that and you, and you looked at each other. And that was just... An imitation, in a sense, of a famous scene, but doing it your own way. Well, it was, what it really was is a, a, what, the point we we're trying to make was like these two guys were the authors of these characters. They weren't written for them and presented to them. They weren't characters that they somehow had to conform to. They were they were the authors of these characters. So. If you do like reverse engineering from the on-screen personality, you can find your way to the actual person because they came up with this stuff. Yeah. So those things, the reason I say an echo is because, you know, it's not a joke what happens to them with that trunk in the suitcase. They're, they're bummed out that they're gonna go get that damn suitcase. Um, they go, do we really need that suitcase? Yeah. I love that line. It's just, it's just funny. I know a lot of comedians and have done comedy a lot. and It's just funny to see people, the echo of people's on-screen or public personas in the middle of a conversation as you're talking to them, you know? Like, they, I can't tell you how many times I've been with, you know, with Tim Heidecker or, or Will Ferrell in, in the middle of a conversation, like, you just start laughing, you're like, what are you laughing at? Like, I, you just are funny, you know, like, <laughs> something about me when you're not trying. So that was an idea that we were playing with in this movie, that their relationship with their wives and some of these jams that they would get into naturally on the road together, they had to have echoes in some of the stuff that they came up with because they were the authors of that. Can I ask you about the wives? Because I thought, you know, sometimes wives are relegated to the sidelines in a movie like this that is about the guys, Stan and Ollie. They were great. Both of these actresses, yes. And their characters and the way they were leading into the story. 
Yeah, that was. I, I gotta say, I didn't see that one coming. <laughs> How great the two women were gonna be in the movie because I was so obsessed with what I had, the responsibility that I had, and all the work that I had to do. Best of luck to you girls. <laughs> uh, and then it turns out they practically stole the movie. It was so funny in the movie. And I thought that, that was a really beautiful thing that John Baird, our brilliant director, did with this movie was that. Here we are, the funny men, Steve and I, and we're playing the funny men, but what we're really doing is showing you what it's like to be a funny man. And then the jokes in the movie, the actual funny bits in the movie, are the wives just being themselves. Uh, I, I thought there was something. Nina, Nina, Nina Arnold, Honda, she's wonderful uh, yeah. actress from Broadway. I know she won a Tony yeah. Yeah. in Born Yesterday. And, um, uh, just amazing kind of performances to come in, and I think that's a tribute to the director too, that you let them shine. Well, well, both the girls and Steve and I were encouraged to, you know, break out of the boilerplate kind of biography moments and make it feel like it feels to be an actor or a performer or a wife or a performer or whatever it is. Um, and so a lot of us, a lot of laughs that those characters get or what those two girls came up with, you know? Um, that whole thing of, no, 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 no touching, no touching. No, that's just me and you know? And, and the kind of back and forth little barbed comments that they make to each other, that was kind of Shirley and Nina getting together and they lived in the same apartment building when we were shooting and they would get together and just throw ideas back and forth and they got to know each other in a similar kind of parallel track to Steve and I. It was a beautiful thing how they came together. And like I said, I did not see it coming because it was sort of, you know, they were, and those scenes that wasn't in. So it was did you shoot in actual locations where they actually did this tour? Yeah, in yeah. These, those, the, I, I assume a lot of those theaters were still there. Yeah, yeah. we shot, not, nothing we saw was a soundstage, um, unless it was Trying to be a soundstage. That's going to be kind of an interesting thing to add to the performance, too, to know that this is where they played it. Oh, yeah. There were, there were a couple moments, I have to say, where, you know, that thing I just said where every morning I'd sit there and, you know, ask for his help. And there were a couple moments where I was standing in those theaters and thinking, like, this is where they stood. This is where they got dressed. This is it. This is where they were. This was their church. And, and and then we would do like the double door routine or something. And keep in mind, like we rehearsed that thing for four weeks or something. And the only audience we, we ever had was like the people on the on the production crew, who are, of course could be supportive and you know encouraging. But we really didn't know if it was going to work or if it was going to get laughs or what was going to happen or if we were going to be able to pull it off. And then we did that double door routine in its entirety. There's a whole dialogue scene and then a hat routine that happens um, that you don't see in the film. But um, we did it in its entirety. And the joy and the laughter coming back from that audience, because it was just a bunch of people who were extras paid for the day. They didn't even know what the movie was about. They just got there and were given some 1950s clothes and sat down. And so that day when I saw, like, the same gags that these guys used were working right now on people that had no idea about it, right? This sort of test audience, you know? I just sort of bawled backstage one time because of the fact, I just felt like a direct link to the past of what they were doing, that what they did in the 1950s, here it was 2017, and it was still working. This, the basics of this clowning were still still getting laughs and still making people feel joy. And like, that was just an overwhelming thing. And it was the first moment when I finally realized we're doing something right. They laughed. We're doing something right. It's not just the people in the production telling us, hey, good job. We're actually doing something right. That is like, you watch that Double Doors routine, I laugh every time. I've seen this movie more than once, too. And every time, I know exactly what's going to happen, and you laugh. And you know, that's classic comedy. It's timeless. It's not dated, and it's something that works for audiences whenever they did it. Which is why I love DVDs, and, uh, and Blu-rays, and
and key chains and however you can watch this, the, you know, Laurel and Hardy live on, they're immortal. Yeah, yeah. yeah. They, and I think it was deliberate from the very beginning of their work. They worked right away. It wasn't like they developed this act and then they got good. They were really good right away. There was something about the alchemy of the two of them that was just sparked right away. Everyone knew it. And I think one of the reasons is, I think the reason for, one of the reasons for the longevity and the reason that their work is still funny is because they didn't trade in contemporary references and you know who's president at the time or you know their movies were the struggles that they had were like eternal human struggles like how do I get this box up these goddamn stairs like whatever it is something that anyone of any political stripe or religion or language or anything could understand I mean, you know when you, I've, I've been in a lot of comedies and I've tried to sell them in other countries or show them in other countries and it doesn't always transfer. Comedy is often culturally based and it doesn't always transfer. These guys were the biggest stars in the whole world at a time when fascism was on the rise, Hitler was right around the corner after the, all these movies were made. You know, they, they showed this unifying power the humanism of their work and the eternal universal quality of their jokes show that it doesn't, you, can, you can unite people with a laugh. No matter what, no matter where you all just came from, when those guys make you laugh, we're all united. We're human beings laughing at something that seems familiar. And that's a beautiful thing. So great. Do you have any other questions here? I know we started that. So yes, yeah, right here. What was the most fun working with Steve Coogan uh, during the process here? Well, I, I alluded to it before, but that whole process of rehearsing together and getting to know each other in a similar way to the way Stan and I must have worked and got to know each other. You, you, so, well, to answer, I should come up with faster answers, man. I like, <laughs> <laughs> minutes to give an answer, but the quick answer is, it was a joy every day to do this stuff. It was not easy, but it was joyful. You know, getting to sing in the, in the trail of the Lonesome Pine, you know, Harvest Moon, doing that dance, you know, doing comedy routines, making each other laugh. That's hard work, you know. It takes a lot of discipline, but it's fun. It's joyful, you know. So I can't say that any part of it was much more fun than the others. I mean, I am a performer, and I got to play a performer, so I was getting to do what I love to do every day. Yes? Uh, I thought the accent work that both y'all did was like very incredible because it wasn't an accent that I'm used to hearing. Right. Did you guys uh, base that on audio recordings of them? Or yeah, well, they're, they're films, films, of course. You know, oh, yeah. there's a lot of, there's a lot of them talking. Um, Although, you know, one of the interesting things about Laurel and Hardy is when, when movies went from the silent era into the sound era, the compulsion of a lot of actors and filmmakers at the time was just wall-to-wall -wall dialogue. We can talk! You know, blah, 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 like, like color. And Stan <laughs> Laura was like, you know, we're doing this sound stuff very well. Let's just, let's just do dialogue where we used to do um, subtitle cards. Let's keep it that minimal. And they made a distinct choice to do that. And it, it's one of the reasons that they transferred so well from silent to sound. But thank you, thank you for your compliment about the accents. They both had really interesting accents, actually. They were rubbed, first of all, they spent so much time together that they rubbed off on each other. Stan Laurel was from Alderson, England, got somewhat more and more Americanized the longer he stayed in America. Oliver Hardy he was from Georgia, who had this kind of southern gentleman, you know, like that. But when you take a southern boy and you, and you tell him to be erudite and classy, you know, like that, his accent was like this sort of. He was he was he was always striving to be fancier than he was. 
So he's trying to do this mid-Atlantic accent, but every once in a while you hear that Jeff Georgia thing slide back in goods. You know? These strange little words of, what? What's that? <laughs> Cindy, a Sunday morning. I saw you guys, that whole convention that you do. That was amazing. So I want to thank you, first of all, for this amazing film and tribute to Laurel and Hardy. My question for you is, besides the three hours makeup, what was the hardest part about playing Oliver Hardy? Well, the dancing was pretty hard. <laughs> and that fat suit, um, no makeup, like, literally get heat stroke and die, but in, like, take the, and this cooling suit, I'd plug into a cooler with like ice water in it, it would circulate all this cold water on my body. Uh, so that was, that was difficult, but honestly, to tell you the truth, first of all, I don't know if you've all heard, but he's from the Sons of the Desert, which is the worldwide Laurel and Hardy fan club. It's based on the title of one of the movies, Sons of the Desert. Um, and you guys have been so beautiful about embracing us in this film. So thank you. Thank you for being here. Thank you for buying the ticket. Um, but I, I have to say, honestly, like every day, with anything that felt difficult or tiring or like, oh man, like, I don't know if I can do this, I would just repeat to myself literally like a mantra, it's for Oliver. It's for Oliver. It's for Oliver. And, and I share your sentiment about being so happy about the world getting to see them again, and the world getting reminded about their genius because they really didn't get their due when they were alive at towards the end of their life. When Oliver passed away, he was living with his mother-in-law in her house. He and Lucille couldn't afford anywhere to live other than her mother's house. You know, Stan had a very modest apartment in Santa Monica. Uh, they were, and that's just a, that's a large part of the mission of the movie, is to remind people like these guys were geniuses. You know, they should be cherished more than maybe they have been. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, in my review, I mentioned that that they were largely forgotten by the time they died, and the stand was actually sort of like in the phone book. His number was there, and people like Dick Van Dyke could call him up and. And then somebody wrote it in a comment, they said, oh, well, you got an honorary Oscar and stuff, but that's not the same. It's, you know, he still wanted to work as this movie shows. He still had writing, and up until the day he died, he was still writing material, is that right? You know, I mean. Yeah, that's, that's true. He didn't, didn't never perform again, but he wrote for he and Oliver. He wrote sketches for them until he died. And he also answered every single fan letter that was ever written to him. And if he called him, he would just start talking to you. Like, that is how Dick Menek like, Dick Menek is 12 years old and called him on the phone. He's like, I bet I can find Stan Laurel. Stan Laurel. Beep, 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 beep. Hello? <laughs> and he was on the phone with Stan Laurel with one try. But. Incredible. More, more sons here. OK, yes. that's 
inspired by this, by these guys to this day. You know, my character, Wreck It Ralph, we would talk about Oliver Hardy all the time when we were recording Wreck It Ralph. Oh! You know, like, whatever those sounds were, like that whole encyclopedic sound library of Oliver. Anyway, you guys have been really patient, so, and I appreciate your coming here tonight. And I really, if you like the movie, tell somebody about it. And go see a Laura Hardy movie tonight if you can. Yeah. Let's take a shot and see Riley.